How'd you like to listen to .NET Rocks with no ads? Easy. Become a patron. For just $5 a month, you get access to a private RSS feed where all the shows have no ads. $20 a month will get you that and a special .NET Rocks patron mug. Sign up now at patreon.netrocks.com. Hey, guess what? It's .NET Rocks. I'm Carl Franklin. And I'm Richard Campbell. Here for your .NET edification, as we are every week since 2001. Well, almost every week. 2002? I think it was 2002. Did I say 2001? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I meant 2002. How silly of me. And I wasn't even there, and I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> What's wrong here? Yeah. Uh, okay, so... Thanks again, and we have some uh, good stuff coming up today. Nick Randolph is here, and we're talking about Uno and other things. And uh, Richard, yeah, how are you, my friend? I'm good. I I really want you to get into your better know because I have uh, comments on it. So very you know, cool. I've, as I've been working on uh, some home assistant stuff, which should not surprise you, knowing me. Okay, uh, and uh, it relates. All right, so let's roll crazy music for Better Know Framework. Awesome. <laughs> All right, man. What do you got? I think I know. So, not that you don't know, yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, from Danny Avila, and it's an, a GitHub repo called Libra Chat. L I B R E Chat. And the explanation is enhanced Chat GPT clone features OpenAI GPT for Vision. Bing, Anthropic, Open Router, Google Gemini, AI Model Switching, Message Search, Langchain, DAL E3, ChatGPT Plugins, OpenAI Functions, Secure Multi-User System, Presets. It's completely open source for self-hosting, more features in development, Film and 11. So this is the, the, the sort of hip thing these days is to host your own GPT engine. In one form or another, although it sounds like it does, does it actually call out to all these different services? It looks like it calls out. Yeah, it's sort of like the one place that you can put your prompts through, and then it calls out to all these different services with API keys. Right. That's I don't know. I haven't run it, but that's what it looks like to me. Yeah, it does look like that's what it's doing. It's doing. You can go to the per call API keys, mm. which I've also done. Mm, me too. Uh, not. Um, yeah, in home and you know, new house. Mm-hmm. Actually, we've had this house for years, and I put in some simple things for when it was a rental house, so how to manage it. But now that it's my place, <laughs> you know, things are getting a little more sophisticated. And one of the features that is popular for us is voice control. Yeah, and the voice control systems were typically done through Google or Amazon, both of which mm-hmm. are not that good and seem to be going away. Like they're both kind of failures. Do you remember when they were awesome? Yes. You know, and we kind of laughed at them. Oh, isn't that funny? You know, yeah. uh, she thought I said, you know, mud yeah. raker when I said something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Right. Like that. And, that, and then, and so uh, HA last year in 2023 had this big open source initiative to do their own voice systems mm. that would be independent of those vendors of the, of the big providers, mm-hmm. uh, which is a big movement in HA in general is to have everything hosted internally. Mm-hmm. And so folks have already done extensions to it to access things like open AI. That's great. So, uh, yeah, because the local recognizers are only so good. And I could make them better with more compute. Like that's one of the things is like switch up to higher end hardware. Mm. But just to see if it would really make a difference, I set up my OpenAI API account and hooked it in. And the you, the problem is you're used to saying very simple phrases to HA to do stuff. Right. Now the fact that you could say, I want you to do this, 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 and this. Right. And it goes, all right, I did this, 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 yeah. this, and this. <laughs> Done. It's like, uh, it's pretty and, scary. Yeah. So, and it, once the boss is using it, you know it's going to stay, right? <laughs> like, so. Yeah, of course. Of course. I, I was just looking at the math and for using, I'm using GPT 3 plus through OpenAI API, cost me about a dollar a month. It's not bad. Pretty easy. I mean, because you're not using it all the time. You're just. No, you're using it only when you need to interact. And it just, right. and it doesn't it cost that much, you know, realistically. Yeah. I, I got used to chat GPT on my phone. I could just pull up with a voice interface. Yeah. I got to ask it anything. And it, you know, has this great uh, understanding, if you will. Um, 
and, the, and it does great responses. But uh, then I get used to that, and right. when I say to the one who starts with A, something that's a little more complex, and it just and she goes, "I'm sorry, I yeah, no, know not what you're talking that. about." Like, <laughs> oh yes, right. I'm talking to I an inferior chat device. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> So, so these things are going away, you say. I mean, I kind of knew they would, but I thought I would have thought Amazon would have, you know, said now with GPT or now with OpenAI. Or yeah. Whatever. You, you wonder if they will. Of course, then they have to go to a vendor that, you know, supports someone else. Like now you get to the reality. Like, let's face it, that product that Amazon made, and we're not saying its name so we don't make people unhappy. Right. We got in trouble for that once. We've gotten in trouble for that before. <laughs> was originally built to sell more stuff on Amazon. Right. Right. I mean, they said as much. They basically gave away the hardware for cost mm -hmm. because they presume that you would say hey you know get me more laundry soap that kind of right. thing which yeah. largely people didn't do didn't do and back you know a couple of three years ago amazon basically admitted this is like we spent billions on this thing yep. it's not paying for itself we're going right. to be cutting back right and and the google devices are even weirder because google mm -hmm. didn't even have that mechanism other than it was just more search information it was just more corporate spying effectively yeah there was no real incentive for them and they said the same thing it's like this is not working for out for us we're going to cut it back mm. just before you know within a year or two then we have this breakthrough with open ai mm. and language fundamentally transforms uh er, language interfaces anyway and now it's a scramble to see who's going to implement what meantime you know, Microsoft's kind of laughing here all that open ai right. stuff runs on azure yep so it's like oh if you're going to use it Come on down and eat some Come Azure. Come on down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's a crazy time for all of us. There's no two ways about it. But I am finding, you know, I, I find I use GitHub Copilot a lot. Mm. And having it added into HA, now I'm going to look at, can I make it totally inside the house, right? Like, it's always, especially here where we're battling outages all the time. It's like, will this function without the internet? Like, yeah. can your smart home function without the internet? And that's the goal always is to get to right. that point. Well, at least a smart device, right? A smart, a Amazon thing like that uh, you can actually use would be really good. Anyway, check out Libra chat. There's the link there, but if Very you cool. want me to just speak it, it's github.com slash Danny dash Avila, A V I L A slash Libra chat. Who's talking to us, Richard? Grab your comments off show 1689, which is the last time I think we talked about Uno. It was with Kenzie Whalen. Yeah. Like there's a while ago mm. uh, who used to be with Uno and we were talking about building apps. So that's back in May, May of 2020. Hence the, you know, show number and this particular comment from that time this is from devin global who's a longtime listener as well hey devin hey uh and devin had this very concrete uh comment he says uh, the promise of cross-platform tools is great build once run everywhere boy we've been mm. telling ourselves that lie for a long yeah, time yeah that's right holy man like uno xamarin forms and now dotnet maui you get the timing right it's back in 2020 uh allowing smaller teams a much broader reach. There's one kind of expertise that seems to get glossed over, and that's all of the nuances in the native design language. Sure, I can use these tools to make a control look native across several platforms. However, it still seems like you need an expert in iOS, Android, and Windows UX to show where and how to use those controls in a way the user expects. Hmm. There's an incredible opportunity for these cross-platform tools to help developers, quote, fall into the pit of success yeah. by using the, the right thing on each platform. Also, it'd be nice to see cross-platform documentation that helps developers understand things from the perspective of a cross-platform developer hmm. instead of as a single-platform developer as each vendor seems to assume. A good start is the documentation from the Xamarin team. In many cases, their docs uh, of iOS APIs is better than the ones that are provided by Apple because they had to reverse engineer a lot of that documentation so, right. you know, back in the day too. There are incredible things on the horizon and I beg the tool vendors not to let JavaScript win this one. <laughs> <laughs> please, please. Because uh, when you talk about the original cross-platform language, man, like that mm. JavaScript has been there a long, long time. Yeah. Right? Or so for better or worse. Uh, I know Nick's got some great comments on this. So we're going to, we'll, we'll do his intro, but Devin, hang in there. We're going to have some comments for you on this and a copy of music to code by is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of music to code by, write a comment on the website at downnowrocks.com or on the Facebooks. We publish every show there. And if you comment there and I read on the show, we'll send you a copy of music to code by. And you can follow us on Twitter or X or whatever the hell they're calling it today. But uh, you can also follow us on Mastodon. I'm at Carl Franklin at techhub.social. And I'm Rich Campbell at mastodon.social. Send us a toot. Okay, let's bring on Nick Randolph. Nick currently runs Built to Rome. 
which focuses on building rich mobile applications. Nick's been identified as a Microsoft MVP in recognition of his work and expertise with the Microsoft application platforms. He's still an active contributor in the device application development space via his blog at nixnettravels.builttorome.com. We'll put a link to that on the show page, too. Nick has been invited to present at a variety of events, including TechEd and Ignite Australia in New Zealand, DDD, NDC, and local user groups. He's also authored multiple books on Visual Studio and Windows development and helped judge multiple world finals for the Imagine Cup. Nick has worked on numerous mobile applications and has helped hundreds of developers build their own mobile applications. Nick has been involved with apps for well-known brands such as Domain.com.au, Ninesman, AFL, NRL, Qantas, JB, Hi-Fi, NAB, Stan, and Boost Juice, and is also uh, uh, working on the Uno platform. What is your uh, what's your role on Uno? Because it's not in your bio. Yeah, I, it, my bio is basically the one that I use for Built to Roam, and so I mean, I am for working full time for the Uno platform, and so mm-hmm. as part of that, I'm one of the sort of the senior team there, um, and we're. There's a huge amount of stuff that we're working on um, to basically accelerate development on a cross-platform um, and so on across quite a lot of the, 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 the day-to-day stuff there, which is really awesome to see. Very cool. So for those who don't know about Uno or don't remember it or, or whatever, uh, I can maybe give you the elevator pitch. It, it, it's, sort of, um, it, it's, for, it's sort of Xamarin, right? And... and Maui, but instead of using the the Xamarin flavor of XAML, you're actually building your apps to a Windows Universal platform. Is that right? Well, it used to be. Yeah. So, so it, what used to be the Universal or UWP, yeah. um, which is now sort of evolved or, you know, Microsoft's V2 version of it, which is WinUI 3 and the WinApp SDK. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah. so. Uno is quite a lot of things, um, and the name kind of alludes to that, so the Uno platform. But it definitely, you're right. At the heart of it is a cross-platform framework, Uno Core, um, right. that is essentially taking the the API set that comes with uh, WinUI or WinApp SDK um, and making it available across all of the, the other platforms. And so the goal there is that, you know, wherever .NET will run, the Uno platform will run. What's different about this in Maui is that Maui seems to be backing away from WinUI or, or just like not maybe backing away from it, but the focus isn't on the Windows desktop experience with Maui, even though it does work. Whereas, you know, that that's what you sort of start with on the Uno platform. Is that right? Yeah. And, and so, the, again, this comes down to the heritage of all of these cross-platform tools is they all come with their own sort of um, their own point of origin. So, yeah. in the case of .NET Maui, obviously that came from Xamarin Forms, which came from Xamarin. And so, yep. their their heritage is in the Xamarin platforms. And yep. so, they've evolved as essentially an abstraction over those and then they integrated win- Windows or UWP. And, and with Maui, it's now based on, on WinUI 3. But they've got their own abstraction there um, and their own direction that they're then taking that um, to go cross-platform. And yet, bringing bringing on board desktop for them has been, you know, something that they brought into their fold. Whereas the Uno you know, platform team have almost come from the other direction. We've come right. from a, a Windows centric API set and making that available cross platform. And so, you know, part of the the platform approach is that we have extra things like the toolkit, which allows us to take what is essentially a Windows framework and make it cross platform in the sense of. Yeah, and, and you alluded to this in the introduction or the, 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 the reader's comments, is that, you know, if you're building cross-platform, when you're building for iOS or Android, you kind of want the app to feel natively at home on that. So you'd expect yeah. things like a navigation bar or you'd expect, you know, the swipe interactions and things like that. And that's where the platform part really comes into it. Isn't there a philosophical point here about do you make your app look native to the device versus make the app consistent across all devices? Yeah, absolutely. Like the Facebook app's kind of the same no matter whether you're using iOS or Android or anything else. Yeah, so, so if we look back to, at the sort of the origins of, of cross-platform, particularly in the .NET space and, 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 and other technologies were similar to this, is that when you know these frameworks came about, there was definitely a philosophy of, make it look at home on the device. So, right. you know, for, for Android, it would be Material. For Windows, it would be Fluent. For iOS, Cupertino. 
Um, and yet that that kind of philosophy, it, it runs into problems because designers essentially have to design things three times. Mm-hmm. Right. And then you're stuck with what looks like every other app on the platform and not really able to apply your own company's brand very well to it uh, or in a consistent way. And so what we found is that the sort of the design philosophy has sort of evolved and shifted. And as you said, what you kind of see today is that the the brand overreaches, overreaches everything in the sense that, you know, your brand is more important than necessarily making it look 100% like an iOS app. Mm-hmm. I haven't used Uno, but I have used Maui a lot. And I find that if you go down the XAML route with Maui, you find you uh, run in pretty darn quickly to things that aren't consistent across the platforms and something that works in, you know, in windows desktop or Mac desktop and might even work in Android doesn't work in iOS. And, Oh, it's because you have to wait because they're working on that. Right. Hmm. And so I got tired of that. And I, because I've been doing blazer since its inception, I use blazer uh, as my UI with Maui. So it's kind of like the hybrid approach. Yeah. Because as Richard said when he was reading the comment, you know, JavaScript is the original cross platform language. And what is Blazor except the C sharpness of JavaScript and with all the, the DOM, which is the real cross platform thing, right? The browser people have figured out how to make their platform cross platform and consistent. And so I find there's more consistency with Blazor in Maui for native for mobile apps, right? Hybrid apps, then then I then I don't run into these little problems that just seem to come out of nowhere and they can really put a dent in your schedule, you know. For sure. And and the browser wars have, have you know it's taken them decades to get to get it to a point where there are less inconsistencies between browsers, between platforms, etc. Right. Yeah. Emphasis, emphasis on less. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Problems. Exactly. Yeah. There, Many less, though. Yeah. Th- there are, and and you know, from a Blazor perspective, a lot of that those inconsistencies are handled by the by the technology, um, and so the integration and the hybrid approach there is a is a valid approach. Um, now, do you get the same level of performance? Do you get the same level of device integration? Um, you know, th- those are all questions that come come to it. Well, I get the same level of device integration, but in performance, I'll, all I care about is if it's going to be good enough, right? Yeah. If, if the user doesn't care, you know, and yeah, yeah you're going to be using more memory. So, you know, lower memory, lower power devices may have an issue, but... But I, anyway, I didn't bring that up to to dis uh, Uno. It's just that I don't know about it. So is there a, yeah for sure? And is there a hybrid mode for Uno? So so we can support doing um, web content. Um, so there is an approach to do that. And one of the things that we're definitely considering and and you know working with our customers on is prioritization around that hybrid level of support. Um, that for not only Blazor but other you know um, web sure. components, whether it build in Angular or React, and they they will make sense to integrate into the the app platform. And from our perspective, we would definitely like to see uh, a more you know a, a, an approach that goes beyond just including um, Blazor. Um, mm-hmm. But just to, just coming back to the the you know the the inconsistencies, I should say, between different mm-hmm. you know technology and different platforms. Um, one of the philosophies behind the Uno platform is is pixel perfect everywhere. And so the idea is that when you build your app for one platform or you, you know, whether you're being, you know, working in the iOS uh, simulator or the Android emulator or on native Windows, um, once you build it, you should have the same rendering experience on all of the platforms. Um, and so, you know, that, and that includes the web and, and Linux and, and stuff, you know, that there is a, a wealth of different platforms that are available using the Uno platform. And the goal is to make sure that they all render pixel perfect. Um, and, and that's not, notwithstanding the fact that we are still using the underlying technology to render. So what I mean by that is, you know, on, on iOS, we're using, you know, the, the native widgets on iOS, yeah. on Android, the same. On Tables, the web, grids, we're using lists. HTML rendering. Yep, exactly. And so you you do get the native capabilities around you know interaction around accessibility. So you know doing things like text to voice. Those are important from the accessibility perspective. And you get all of those because we're using the device components, even though we've made sure that we're getting a pixel perfect rendering between the the different platforms. Yeah, and the other side of pixel perfect rendering is 
perfect behavior replication. I mean, that's maybe even more important. When I expand, uh, you know, a multiple hierarchy tree or list or whatever, is it going to behave the same way on iOS as it does in Android? This is just one thing I'm thinking about from, uh, you know, lists of lists within lists and nests <laughs> yeah. of things have been a real problem in Maui's AML in the last year. Yeah. And, 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 you know, performance is one of those things that we keep on coming back to and try to continue to improve and work on because, you know, that because you got that abstraction layer, um, mm-hmm. you know, what works on one platform that doesn't necessarily work the same on other platforms. So there, there is a, you know, a, a, a continual effort to make sure that we're performing the best we can on all, all platforms. And so, yeah. I think it kind of calling back to Devin's comment on all of this, I think there's a broader idea of are you building this for internal use versus showing it to the public? I don't know what your customer base looks like, Nick, like, because I do think there's a very different attitude to, Hey, we need to make this work for the company on their mobile devices versus we want the public to use it. Yeah. Look, absolutely. Uh, and, and what we saw very, in the very early days of, of sort of mobile apps is that the, the companies would invest no cycles into anything design related. And what they found is the, the, you know, the attrition of, of the usage of those, of those apps were very low. Right. So these days with something like the Uno platform, you could still rapidly build out an application. And we'll talk a little bit more about the various other platform components that help with that process. Um, but you can very rapidly build out an application that looks really good. It's pixel perfect on every device. Um, and yet is rolled out really quickly for the enterprise. Now, that's not to say that you couldn't build a, you know, a Facebook of the world um, style application or quality level, of, uh, you know, including animations and things like that with the Uno platform. But what we do see is that a lot of enterprises are coming to the Uno platform because of that rapid ability to rapidly roll out applications. And is it for the internal use apps or are they thinking about the public facing apps? It, uh, it can be for both, definitely for sure. I'm, I'm with you. It's just I, I would think the requirements are different. Um, look, they are, and for for you know what we refer to as typically consumer facing apps, um, a lot of those will have fairly heavy graphic um, kind of requirements on them. So you know right. they'll have very in- intricate transitions. Um, you know some of some of the th- the apps like Facebook and Twitter are actually incredibly simple from a transitions perspective. But then you can look at some of the more creative shopping based applications, and they've got some very sophisticated animations and and things like that. And those ones are, are ones where we will prioritize you know the different animations and the different flows as they come in from our customer requirements. Um, but def- but definitely, I mean the you know for. For people who, or for, for companies that want to build out an application, even if it's consumer facing, the internet platform is a great choice and a great starting point for them. Right. I mean, and in, you're mostly describing the aesthetic elements that co- that consumers are going to want a really good looking app, and it's worth putting time in it. Where your employees can live with a mediocre interface as long as it's functional. I'm I actually, my for me, the thought was, well, we know that these cross-platform frameworks have an overhead. Their te- apps tend to be larger and so forth. But I wonder if the consumer cares at all. Yeah. Like, who looks at memory usage in an app except a geek? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think probably three or four years ago, you know, size of app and download speeds and stuff like that was super critical. I think with modern devices, particularly in, like, the you know, the, the, the developed world, yeah, we don't tend to focus on those as much. Um, definitely, if you're targeting, you know, areas where there is low coverage and and devices will be typically, you know, a generation or two older, then that can still be a priority. And and yeah, that is definitely one area where you know native will win out. So if you build right. using the, the pure native tools, you'll always be able to get a smaller runtime, a smaller footprint, etc. Yeah, I would argue when you get down to low bandwidth and so forth, you switch to web. <laughs> like they're not going to run the client anyway. Uh, possibly, um, although you know, when you're talking about low bandwidth, you know, if you're going to rural, rural areas, web's not an option because you don't have any local caching and you don't have any, lo- you know, offline support. Right, and lo- well, PWA supposedly, but yeah, you can. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just a, none of it's good, all of it's bad. I, I was going to say. PWA, for the investment that you would spend getting it to work on PWA, you could have built using the Uno platform and have a full synchronization solution. I could just download my code from Blazor Train. Nice. Yeah, that's fair enough. But, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but to your point that when it comes to disconnected scenarios, 
these frameworks help a lot it's, and yeah. uno specifically yeah and and w- one of the really interesting things about that is that you know there are other technologies out there so flutter and you know other you know mm-hmm. cross platform frameworks that are out there and one of the the nice things that we benefit from being in the microsoft in- ecosystem is all of the the libraries and and technology and all of the f- open source that goes on in terms of these things like synchronization frameworks and you know people have got there's so much invested by microsoft and third parties into making such a broad ecosystem uh, that we all benefit from and so, if, you know, if something's built that's built for .NET 8 or .NET 7, you can bring into your Uno platform application just via a NuGet reference. And it's just incredible the amount of stuff that just works. Um, so, yeah. That's an old Esther Dyson line. It's like it was easier to make connectivity everywhere than it was to make a good disconnected client. It, that was tr- that was true 20 years ago, and it's true today. Yeah. No, today, <laughs> no. It's like, yeah, we'll just make the, air, you know, Starlink, more internet everywhere. I, I caught up with one of the fellow MVPs uh, probably a couple of weeks ago now, and we were reminiscing about the old Pocket PC days. And I swear that we are still building this, or still tackling the same fundamental problems oh, sure. in terms of app development today that we were 15, 16 years ago. You know, it's just incredible. I mean, we have a better user experience, and it's easier to use Zowl to, to build an incredible, you know, user interface. Um, but fundamentally, we're still solving the same problems. Well, and it's still the same issue, which is the customer couldn't care less about cross platform. It's only us that cares about it. The customer just wants to work on their device. Uh, absolutely. 100%. Yes. Um, and, and this is where the investment into technology such as WebAssembly is going to be really interesting because mm-hmm. um, and, and WebAssembly, not just in the browser, but also if you think about the ability to run a WebAssembly app in a native, like in, a, in a, essentially a sandbox oh, yeah. right. on any device, that's kind of like an interesting story because now all of a sudden you back to your point about having web technology that now runs everywhere. Mm. If you can make it work in WebAssembly, so any language, you could. It's, yeah, yeah, exactly. You can now run it on any piece of technology that's able to run a you know a sandbox WebAssembly. Right? It's the universal, well, the the nascent universal. Uh, runtime operating yeah. system yeah yeah if you will now you know where it gets weird and i've had conversations with sanderson on this you know over a whiskey or two is at the edge like on a cdn i could mm-hmm. be running a, a wa container so you know headlet it's not the client it's not the server it's in between yeah and you know yeah he's already thought of all these things of course he has and he thought about <laughs> years, years ago, ago. Yeah. years ago yeah 10 years ago like he i'm pretty sure he's actually an alien <laughs> and he's just come down to help us, you know. Uh, but we should probably take a break. Yeah, let's do that. We'll be uh, right back after these important messages. And we're back. It's .NET Rocks. I'm Carl Franklin. That's Richard Campbell. Hey. And uh, we're talking to Nick Randolph about the Uno platform, the latest, the greatest, the newest which I don't think we've talked about all that much yet, actually. No, you know, we, we, no, no, we've sort of been in philosophy land over here. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about Uno. Yeah, we talked about the philosophy around Uno, the core, um, yeah. but there's Uno, the platform. And, you know, one of the, the motivations behind the name is that, you know, it's all about building, you know, just not just the core, but all of the bits that a developer needs from design all the way through to publishing your app. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, over the last, you know, X number of years, we've been, you know, building not just the core, but there's things like the toolkit. We've got an, a, a raft of extensions that are based on, you know, what Microsoft's done with the Microsoft extensions, but tailored to building an Uno platform. So, you know, there's device specific bits and bits in there that we can leverage through extensions. We've got support for C sharp markup. So you're not just restricted to XAML anymore. You can now, you know, use a very fluent or uh, um, structured C sharp markup language to basically, you know, create your apps. That's very cool. Yeah. And and again, that's about breaking down the le- the learning that developers have to go through to actually building apps. Right? You still need to understand, you know, things like what's a text block and what's a button and stuff like that. Sure. But, you know, you you're not learning a a, you know, a language which was really designed for a, a tool, right? At the end of the day, nobody likes writing XAML or XML. I mean, those are always tool-oriented technologies, um, even though some of them, like myself, just did, did get very fluent at being able to write them. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we now have, you know, incredible C-sharp markup, which which mirrors the capability of XAML, um, and yet gives us this ability to write the entire app just in C-sharp. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I mean, and I certainly that's appealing to folks. It's like this is the language I know and I'm comfortable in. This is what my team knows. Like it's, as as little JavaScript as possible, please. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and we look, we get that that feedback consistently, and hence the mm-hmm. investment over the last twenty four months um, around bringing offerings like C Sharp Mark up to the table. Um, the other, the really important development that we've been spending a lot of time on is the is that gap between where designers finish and where developers pick up. And so we've got a component that actually lives within Figma um, and allows you to essentially mm. export not just XAML, but also C-sharp markup. So if you want to live in the C-sharp world, you can just e- export your design into C-sharp markup, drop it into your app, and off you go. And so that that's we see that as quite an important tool in breaking down that barrier between, you know, the cognitive loss that gets that's happens between designers and where, where they were thinking about how things should look and stuff like that. And the way developers tend to put things together, which <laughs> we've all been there, right? Now. Well, and, and I'm, I'm and I appreciate you bringing up Figma because a, a couple of years ago it was a beloved tool. It's like this is the way, yeah. and then Adobe showed up, and we all kind of held our breaths. It's like, well, that's where good software goes to die, <laughs> and now they're not buying it. Like, I feel like we're going to have a Figma renaissance because the deal failed. They had to pay, they had to pay them a billion bucks as a settle because they, they couldn't buy it. So mm. yeah, I don't know what's going to happen to Figma now, but if I was a designer, there's, there's a lot of stuff. I'm partying. Like that's such great news. Mm. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff happening in the Figma world. They've got you know, a new dev mode. This person that's, and then again, they've, they've identified that they're one of their markets is this, you know, ability for designers to create this app experience, not just mm-hmm. single pages and web pages and stuff like that, but whole app experiences and then be able to pull out the resources and the the, the assets from that um, in a way that it's consumable from for developers. And, and you hit on the key point here, which is how many times is a designer finished with a design, headed to devs and they look at it and go, well, we're not making that. <laughs> like it's just yeah. so detached from the tool set I've got. And and I think Figma is aware of of the software development life cycle. Obviously, they build their own tool, um, mm-hmm. but they're aware of it at a at a general level because they're not just investing in the tools within Figma. They're also working on things like design systems. And mm-hmm. so, and essentially, what that means is that they're making it so that you can export parts of Figma as assets. So whether those be you know your color assets, your style assets, your font assets, um, in a way that can be consumed into things like your CI pipeline. Right. Right, so you know they're they're aware and they're starting to think along the same lines as developers have been for years, and so Uno is trying to leverage that in in you know and recognize that we need to be part of that pipeline. Hmm. There's definitely that moment between the first designer pass that gets approved and the dev successfully rendering that page. Yeah, like it's almost an interim step. Like until we convert their design language into our design language, you can't really get rolling. You know, the I, I was introduced to Figma just to, as an aside a couple of years ago, and the the customer wanted me to you know do the design in Figma and then copy the uh, you know the, the CSS into my project, and that was fine. And I don't know if it does this now, but back then there was no responsiveness, and that you know you put a you get some design and all that stuff, and I copy it and you know it's static. It doesn't move with the page, which seemed to me like really stupid. Uh, I don't know if that f- feature is there now, but you know, it's the little details like that that drive you nuts. Yeah, so so I think Figma's definitely come a long way on that, and definitely a lot of their components. Are, and I'm definitely no wizard here, um, mm. but they're definitely their components now understand a little bit of responsiveness. It's not to the extent of knowing between like portrait and landscape but they know how things like should expand and things like that so you know yeah that's good it was a couple of years ago and i'm certainly no expert in css <laughs> <laughs> well yeah and responsive design is hard at the best of times much less cross-platform responsive design absolutely yeah I, and you know that that is one of the common problems that, that surfaces all the time and we're continuing to invest in better controls and better widgets to help developers deal with that. And, you know, we, we see various breakpoints, particularly on desktop or web, where you go from a sort of a more portrait oriented, you know, layout where you might mm-hmm. have it pinned to the left and you want it kind of looking like a list. Um, and then when you navigate, it should show you the details almost on a new page versus a more landscape or desktop experience where you typically have them side by side. Um, and, you know, 
that should all work within an app and it should be consistent. And then things like deep linking should work so that you could navigate to it on the web. Um, so, you know, it, it poses very interesting challenges. And, and, you know, those are the types of things where, you know, the, our investment into extensions allows for things like deep linking and for, you know, resolvable addresses and stuff like that. Mm-hmm comes into the play in toolkit we have things like responsive views and stuff like that that will help you know deal with having different visual states essentially for that sort of portrait look and the landscape look and, and this gets back to that mapping stage it's like now i pick up the uno toolkit i've got the output from figma and i'm trying to figure out how to map it onto the toolkit to say well this is what they wanted in figma when it scales how does how do we make sure that Uno does that for us? Yeah, and and that's where the the, the Figma plugin comes in. Okay, um, and so you know the the that plugin that sits within Figma. Um, one of the really cool things about it is that there's actually a rendering that actually happens within the plugin, and that's actually running the web or the Wasm version of Uno. So it actually shows you what it's going to look like with your like basically takes your design, converts it to XAML um, behind the scenes, runs it. So that it actually shows you what it's going to look like and how it's going to behave when you click in the text box and stuff like that. So it's it's pretty incredible what the plugin's capable of. And then of course you can then take that and actually drop it into your running app. Like so you go to the XAML file, drop it in whilst your app's running, and Hot Reload will actually show it in your running app. Nice. Um, so it's all the wonders of, of the Microsoft ecosystem. I mean, Hot Reload is something that Mark came out of Microsoft. Um, that the Uno platform is basically built on a makes of work. Yeah, and live debugging too, right? Like it's all part of that effect. So I could be tweaking this. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping the plugin's perfect, but I imagine I have to do some stuff and then look across the different platform renders too, like fire up all the simulators. Yeah, correct. And, and you know, they're, they're, we don't claim that there's never any in uh, discrepancies between the different platforms. So there's always a need to run it up on each platform that you plan mm-hmm. on should be verifying that it's going to, that it is looking and behaving exactly how you want it. Because yeah, sure. Scaling may work differently on different that one. The, the break points between say portrait and landscape may not be the, the same, or you may want to, to, to tweak it based on right. feedback from different platforms. So definitely diff, um, consistencies there. One of the, one of the interesting things that we added to the, the, the wizard, um, and so I'll talk about that in a second. But mm-hmm. we added the ability for um, it to generate your CI pipeline. And so one of the things we consistently see from developers is them struggling at the other end of the of the build process is that, hey, I've got my app that I've spent time building. How do I ship it? How do I make sure that, you know, when I'm making changes to it, I don't break it? How do I run like tests and unit UI tests and things like that? Right. So out of the box, we give you the ability to have a, you know, a CI pipeline that's set up to at least build your application. So you're already in a winning state there. The the wizard itself, yeah, one of the things we had trouble with with the whole platform is that we have all of these different bits and pieces that unless you've spent time reading through the documentation, you wouldn't know existed. You know, there was a very good template that allowed you to get started with an Uno app, but it kind of left everything else to you. And so, one of the things we invested in, uh, you know, in the last 12 months is a, is a wizard that, that brings in a good proportion of the capability of the whole platform. And so, you know, there's 10 or 11 screens that you can go through and customize everything from, you know, what target platforms you want to use all the way through to, do I want authentication? And if so, do I want to write it myself with custom auth or do I want to use MCell? Um, and so, and, and the CI pipelines are there as well. So you can pick between Azure and GitHub actions, um, as your pipeline of choice. Um, I'm right. sure there's others that people want those, then we'll consider adding those as well. Um, but the idea is that when you file a new project, you get a, you know, a good percentage of the way you want with all of the, you know, most of the, you know, almost best practice or guidance that we can do. Um, to get you into that winning state. So all you need to do is push it up to your repository um, and at least you'll have a, a positive experience with a build that you know works. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because people's integration pipelines are pretty personal too, right? So I guess it's yeah. a very challenge to have, if you're going to generate part of that pipeline, does it match with the way we're doing things? Yeah, sure. And, and look, the, um, right now what, what the wizard generates is very much a starting point. So we mm-hmm. make sure that you're set up to do a build of the, the whole solution. Um, we are working on extensions there that will help you run the, the at least the tests and the UI tests because um, those are actually quite difficult to particularly the UI tests to get running in a, in a um, 
uh, a CI pipeline. Right. Um, and then the the additional parts that we're, we're you know considering down the line is the, the support for things like App Center and actually pushing to the store because um, those are again where where a lot of developers really struggle. Sure. Yeah. So just giving them a template to go get get down the right path is great. I mean, I I appreciate that you're doing this DevOps stuff for your platform. So that we have a good experience with your platform, but if you can make us better elsewhere, Nick, I'm yeah. all over that because we're <laughs> struggling. Right. This well, is look, hard. The, the nice, the, the nice thing, and you know, should work mostly, is that because we're all in the .NET ecosystem, um, a lot of that stuff. So .NET build, you know, you can point that at a, an Uno app, but you could also point it at a, you know, an other technology app yeah, that sure. should build. Um, and so a lot of those stages, like pointing to the store or pointing to App Center and things like that, those will work for other .NET based applications as well. It's excellent. We haven't talked much about App Center because it's just one of those things you should use. I mean, this is like the remnants of the old hockey app plus a bunch of other Azure stuff. Mm. Yeah, and and it it's uh, one of those things that Microsoft acquired and brought together and actually started elevating. Um, and I've I've always viewed it as. It had some really winning features, so you know, the, the simplification of the build process and encouraging developers to actually have that kind of approach to the build and test. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the the ability to run UI tests and device tests and stuff like that was really cool, um, and and the deployment side of things for testing was was one of the killer features of App Center. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, definitely, we highly encourage a, um, developers to push to App Center to to provide that distribution. But it's not to say that you can't. Do it without App Center, so you can sure. push to you know the you know the Android beta store and and the iOS um, using the, the essentially test flight um, to actually push out the um, debug or uh, pre built versions. Um, but App Center definitely made those problems easier to deal with. Well, I mean, you mean test flight for iOS? Are you meaning test flight for iOS? Uh, test flight. Yep. Yeah. As what's the Android equivalent? I can't remember. Uh, well, they, they have a beta version of their store. So you basically submit to the store and then you, you mark it as beta and it allows you to do that kind of same process. Oh, uh, Android does. Yeah. Okay. So you're talking about test flight, which is Apple's way to do beta deploys? Yeah. And so, you know, the, the each of the stores, so um, Apple have a way of doing essentially beta deploys. Um, the, the Android store has a way and and... Um, the Microsoft Store actually has a mechanism for doing that as well. So, flighting essentially pre release versions of, of their apps. So, all, all the platforms have that. And obviously, in the web, you can point to a staging environment and you know, lock it down, et cetera. Um, so, it's definitely um, a good mechanism to follow through with, with you know, apps as they go into that sort of pre release or that testing phase is to mm-hmm. make them available for a select group of, of, of audience. Um, and, and, you know, internally in Uno, we actually make use of those processes to make sure that we have, you know, canary builds um, available for our internal testing. Um, and, and just touching on that, one of the things that we do try to encourage um, for all of our customers is to look at this thing that we talk about as being canary builds. And what we mean by that is basically taking your existing app that you're currently working on and testing forcibly updating it to all of the latest versions of the uh, of all your packages because uh, this is something that developers typically don't do frequently enough um, and then running it through your CI pipeline to make sure it builds it runs all your tests and it hasn't broken anything the advantage there is that you as soon as a, one of your dependencies upgrades to a new version um, you're going to be aware that it's now breaking something and that you will not necessarily have to fix it right now, but you'll know that you need to address it in the upcoming versions. Right. Because what we typically see time and time again, and, and this is true for, for Uno Core itself, is that developers don't upgrade because something has broken and then they end up three versions behind. And now you're really in trouble. Yeah. And, you know, we've stopped shipping updates to that version. So, you know, you really need to update and now it's a really painful process. And so, by encouraging developers to have canary builds that they might run once a day or once a week Mm -hmm. um, to see what packages have have changed, um, it gives them early warning uh, as to when things will, when they need to modify their code. Yeah, you only have to miss a couple of sprints, you know, while you try, well, we'll fix that later. Let's go finish these other features. Mm -hmm. And then it misses a round or two, and now it's a year. I mean, I think we're incredibly lucky that the, you know, the upgrade cycle from, you know, net six to net seven to net eight, 
um, hasn't typically required significant rework. Um, no. In fact, the only work that you typically see is things like the analyzers improve and they, they, they now throw more warnings because the code analysis is better and they can yeah. say, okay, well, you're going to get a performance gain if you do this over this. Um, and so typically what you're going to have to do is go through and address those. And um, a lot of our projects, we typically have them, you know, warning set as error so that we're forced to go and fix them. Yeah. And that's great. Right up until you do get one of the updates and now there's a thousand freaking warnings. <laughs> yeah. Now it's but, like, you know, oh, warnings could just be warnings. Yeah. L- luckily, a lot of those ones that generate a thousand warnings are very, very consistent. Yeah. Like they're search or replaceable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and quite often we'll point to you an area of your code where you may be able to do a global refactor beyond what they're talking. So, you know, you, yeah. you might have missed the fact that you're reusing the same bit of code three times or something. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's big. I, I mean, I, I'm with you. It's just, it, it, I also needed to ship features, right? Like, there's just this Absolutely. constant battle between, hey, there's a better way to do this versus, yeah, but they really need this thing out this month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, look, that's why canaries are great because they give you yeah. that really early warning. You can start to factor any rework and get them on the board. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so it doesn't become this, hey, we've got to dedicate three sprints to just catching up. Yeah. Yeah, rather than get behind on it. Uh, what is the testing approach for Uno? You're, you, you hinted at it in the in the pipeline. Yeah, so so we do a couple of different testing, um, and some of these come from our guidance around what we do internally. Um, mm-hmm. So where possible for you know, a lot of your business logic, um, unit tests are still the way to go. So you know if you have services that make calls and you have view models and stuff like that, where you can, you still will want to be running unit tests to 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 verify you know that the logic of your application is sound. Um, but you know where most of the testing in mobile apps goes is in the UI side of things and making sure right. that the flow works. And so that for that we have we do have UI tests. So essentially, this is running the app stepping through various parts of the app and verifying conditions. So it may be verifying that snapshot from one page to the next hasn't changed, but one iteration of the build from one next to the hasn't changed. Are you using Verify, Simon Crop's tool? Uh, we don't use it internally. I would recommend using it. Um, it it's an absolutely awesome tool. Um, and so, you know, again, you know, doing comparison for screenshots and stuff like that is absolutely fantastic. I know we... We had the good fortune to talk to Simon Crop, and you were an instant believer, Carl, as I recall. Like you've used it ever since. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Very cool stuff. Yeah, that that uh, Simon Crop developed some amazing tools over, uh, over the time, and, and verifies one of them. Yep. Yeah, he's one of sure. you. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, and that's I mean, I and I brought that whole line of thinking up, Nick, because testing UIs is hard. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, I love a unit test, but that's because I have a clear input and output. And if they don't match, say something. Yeah. Especially but, native UI, right? Yeah. Because you're generally comparing pixels sometimes, aren't you? Yeah. Well, if, if you've ever take, stopped in and taken a look at the, the Uno platform pipeline, it takes about four hours to run oh, um, because, you know, we're running UI tests and, and that's doing a lot of stuff in parallel. Like we run mm-hmm. UI tests yeah. on iOS, Android, where, you know, the, the works um, for the core framework and that, and that, Gives us a lot of confidence when we ship new versions. Yeah, um, that the the core is very well tested. That's great. It's good to know. Well, and it, and, it, and it speaks to you know. I'm realizing like we've been talking about Uno for five six years now. Like, mm-hmm. there's a reason you guys are still out there. You've been you've transformed a couple of times. You know, once upon a time you were the UWP guys, but that's all changed. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and you had that WA hook in the early days before it was cool. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so the, so the the UWP thing is interesting because even today, if you're going to build a UWP app and you want to mm-hmm. take it cross platform, you can still use the Uno toolset to do that. We still mm-hmm. fully support UWP, right? Um, and you might think, well, why do you why would you do that if you're supporting you know WinUI? Um, the reason being is that there are still some platforms, namely Xbox where you have to build for UWP. Yeah. And so, mm-hmm. you know, those scenarios are, are still out there. We still have customers who and people out there with UWP apps that want to take them cross-platform or want to take parts of their app cross-platform. Sure. And they, and they may have some, and, and they're looking at, or I rewrite. Yeah. Right. It's like, given that choice, it's like, we we committed to UWP back in the day. We've got this stuff. We have these, we're concerned about what Microsoft's doing with UWP or not doing as the case may be. Uh, and, and want to go the cross plat part, and you guys can pick a lot of that up. Yeah. And just to be clear, when you're talking about Xbox apps, you're really talking about like, you know, forms apps, if you will, on Xbox, not games, not graphics. 
Correct. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, there, there was a time when Microsoft wanted Xbox to be center of the living room. Yeah. And so, you know, they did do a very big push for, you know, app developers to come on board. Um, and UWP was that platform. I mean, there, there was a great vision about UWP being, yeah. you know, this capability of running everywhere. Um, and some of that still exists today. There, there's some hints that they're going to make another stab at it too, you know. What, like XNA version 9? That kind runner? of thing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, just, just a sense that the team is reorganizing. Like there's, there seems to mm. be something going on there that we're that living on. You know, I spent some time over on the windows weekly side too. And yeah, this has been a recurring thread. It's like, there's wonder, something going on over here. I wonder if that'll trickle over to HoloLens. Yeah. So, so the interesting thing is if you, if you've been watching the win UI or the WinApp SDK team over the last couple of years, mm-hmm. um, it feels like they really haven't been moving very fast, No, but they're doing a lot of investment, which is actually one of the very first times that we've seen this with one of their UI frameworks internally to to use it for first party apps so things like file explorer you know probably one of the most used apps on windows right new version of that's being done in WinApp sdk yeah Hmm. and that's smart right like we like it when microsoft eats the dog food a you know it'll never go away Mm -hmm. yeah exactly and and b it they beat their own teams up like yeah WPF was pretty much unusable until the studio team used it. Yeah, correct. Back in 2010. Like the the difference between WP2 and WP4, because numbers are hard, (laughs) uh, was the studio team had implemented inside of studio. It had problems, but they'd also kick the snot out of it. Yeah, yeah. I remember those days fondly. Mm. Um, Just just interesting on that, um, one of the other sort of areas where we see customers coming to the owner platform are from, you know, companies that have invested in WPF. Right. And so one of the really neat things that you can do there is to start building new components with the Uno um, on your existing UW, uh, WPF app. So we have the ability to integrate with mm. an existing app. Nice. Run the Uno parts. And that gives you the ability to take parts of your app cross platform. And, you know, obviously probably wouldn't do that necessarily too much on the desktop, but it makes a lot of sense for iOS and Android to take part of your app cross-platform. So, for example, it may be a new data capture part. Mm -hmm. You can really use all of your business logic that you already have, all of your service calls, all of that stuff, build the parts that you need for your mobile data capture part in Uno, and all of a sudden you haven't have to rebuild your app just so you can take it cross platform. Right. So you got a WPF app and at one point you were kind of looking at Xamarin Forms and like, is this gonna work for me? And then it, now it's become Maui. You're still wondering if it's gonna work for you. Uh and we're not even gonna say Silverlight. Oh damn. Uh, <laughs> yes, we all we all love that. <laughs> but that I mean, but what I hear you describing is essentially saying, "Hey, I could add into this a couple of Uno components, and we have this piece of this larger WPF app that now runs on iOS and Android." Yeah, absolutely. Um, what is the uh, Mac OS story for Uno? So the Mac OS is is Mac Catalyst. Um, so basically, the the uh, the, the the Mac Lite kind of work version. <laughs> it's kind of like that that sort of the technology that came from iOS land went through right. iPad and came over on Catalyst. Um, but, you know, for, for the vast majority of apps, that is a great technology to use. Do we have access to native uh, platform tools there? Um, it, it is devices? more of a, a sandbox device than what you'd get with a Mac OS app. So same as Maui, basically. Yeah, correct. Um, and, and a lot of this is driven by the, the fact that the, the Microsoft support for Mac OS as a, you know, as a, as an alternative to Mac Catalyst, um, mm. has not had the same amount of attention that the Mac Catalyst got courtesy of it being driven by the Maui team. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So, yeah. So, you know, that, that's kind of where we are in that sort of Microsoft ecosystem running on Mac scenario. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yes, I don't think there's a whole lot of Mac OS desktop development going on, except for like your, you know, your Adobe's and your music and video editing and all that stuff. And that's all pretty native. It's all very native and very mm. close to the metal. Yeah, but but there, there's there's definitely an opportunity there, particularly. I mean, if you if you do have a lot of customers in the iOS space, um, Catalyst and and be able to have that same level of information available on the on the Mac yeah. makes sense. Um, yeah, and the and the ability point. to that you basically get it for free with Uno, like in the sense right. of you know you're already building for all of these other platforms, 
you know, you, you, you've got desktop support through Windows. It's going to look very similar on Mac OS. Right. Through Catalyst. Yeah, yeah exactly. Awesome. Very cool. So, Nick, what's next for you? What's in your inbox? Um, so, the, the, the big news is that we continue to invest in that, um, in the, that sort of ecosystem. Um, so, life like beginning to end of um, the developer lifecycle. So, continue mm-hmm. to invest in the wizard. Uh, we're likely to see some some updates to improve productivity in terms of developers and the areas that developers really struggle with in terms of building and deploying apps. Mm-hmm. Um, and that cycle will continue to go this year. And that that is heart and soul of what the Uno platform is about. You know, and that's not to say that we're continue to not continue to invest in the core. Um, there mm-hmm. is part of the team that's devoted to that. So you know, performance is still front of mind. Um, there's still a lot of updates that are going to come across for various platform pieces there. Um, there's, there's, you know, there, there are new controls that are on the horizon for t- things like toolkit and extensions. Um, but definitely that, that life cycle that's beginning in design, ending with, you know, an app that's produced out of my pipeline into the stores, you know, trying to improve the productivity for end to end for developers is, is where the team's going for this. You know. And I and I love your Greenfield story, but I'm starting to love your Brownfield story. Mm-hmm. I got an app and I can add Uno in partway through. Mm-hmm. Like, thank you. Because that's real life. And and look, we recognize that as well. Yeah. And and look, the reality is that um just talk about one little extra bit here is the reality is that, you know, not every control manufacturer or vendor is actually building controls for for, for the Uno platform. And so what we can do with the Maui embedding that we've got is the ability to take controls from Syncfusion or from Telerik and bring them onto an Uno application. Now, obviously, those will only be supported on the platforms that they support for Maui. So if they choose to support, you know, all of the Maui platforms, iOS, Android, Catalyst, Windows, then you'll get those on, you know, by embedding those within the, the Uno platform. So, yeah, we totally recognize that that Brownfield story where things aren't as neat and tidy as, as we'd expect them to be. It's you totally mean every piece of software I've ever I built? That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Um, uh, and just to be perfectly clear, this is an open source project with paid support available. That is exactly right. Yep. So it's it's 100% open source um, and there is this paid enterprise support available. That's how you guys stay alive. It, absolutely. It is indeed. Yeah. It pays the bills. Now, I, I want people to know, right? It's like, hey, you can take this out for mm-hmm. spin. I, I like your free support. It's good. But if you're going to commit your business to this, buy some support yeah. so that you get priority yeah. and so you keep a platform you care about alive. Yeah. And, and look, good. if you, if you, if you monitor the GitHub repositories and there's a few of them, um, you'll see that virtually all of them have, uh, have an active contributor from the Uno platform team. Yes. I also like that you drive your paid support through issues in GitHub too, so that everybody benefits from it. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. It's really, I mean, you know, there's a subtext to their, uh, an ongoing conversation for us at .NET Rocks about how we make sustainable open source. Yeah. And you guys are on my list of people doing it right. Like showing a model that works. Yeah, look, it's just sustainable um, open source is a, is a challenge, and there's no one model that's going to fit everyone. Um, True, I think that there was there was a view that things like you know sponsorship and things like that might be an answer, um, mm-hmm. but I think that people are walking away from that because you know the reality is that um, the people who who should be paying, which are typically the companies are not the ones who are typically fronting the money. Um, yeah. And often there's developers who recognize the hard work that, you know, so mm-hmm. many contributors put in um, that are contributing, you know, a dollar here or $10 there, you know, um, in support of it. Yeah, That's, that can't sustain a company. Now, and I, I want to fix that first part that because I, I agree with you, it's not happening. But I also appreciate that there are business models out there that work, that they have their challenges. I just mean, you know, I wish we could be better, but um, we'll all try and do the right thing. For sure. Nick, it's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, keeping us up to date on Uno and what you've been doing. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. It's been fantastic. You bet. All right. We'll talk to you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Plop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com 
for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the MCC. Yes, I'm a...